Hello and welcome to APP to APP virtual lectures. We have two viewer audiences this evening, APP to APP and My Catholic Doctor. Thank you for being here. My name is Amanda Misho. I'm a physician assistant practicing in clinical immunology as well as allergy in Jacksonville, Florida. And I'm excited to bring you this talk today about food allergy diagnosis and management. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. We're going to spend a lot of time dispelling some myths, how to properly diagnose allergy, how to come up with a food allergy action plan, and the new and emerging treatments we have available for food allergy. One of the first and most important things I would like to mention is that in the allergy practice, we spend more of our time undiagnosing food allergy than we do diagnosing food allergy. So if that just sets the tone for this whole conversation, I hope you guys stay tuned for it because you're gonna learn a lot and, um, and really get kind of inside our heads and what we look for when we're diagnosing and managing these patients. So let's dive in. These are my disclosures. Nothing's really pertinent to our talk today. Our learning objectives very briefly are listed here. We're gonna review the presentation, the natural course, and a little bit about epidemiology of food allergy. We're gonna talk about the patients that should be evaluated for food allergy, how to select appropriate tests to diagnose food allergy. We're going to spend a lot on that, both the validated and unvalidated tests available for food allergy. We're gonna talk about food allergy management plans and how to educate your patients on how to manage food allergic reactions. And we're also going to spend a little bit of time discussing emerging treatments for food allergy, including immunotherapy and other therapies, as well as a little tiny bit at the end about um, prevention and early introduction. So what is a food allergy? Food allergy is an adverse health effect arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly upon exposure to a given food. That exposure is typically oral with very few exceptions. We'll talk about that later. And reproducibility is key here. This is something that will occur every single time that food is ingested. It's a big myth that food allergy reactions get worse with each reaction, but rather the truth is that they can change time to time to time. In infants and toddlers, thankfully, we don't typically see severe reactions, but they're possible. But with every exposure, that reaction can change. So there'll be some type of reproducible, some type of clinical symptoms. These reactions can be both IgE mediated, which we're going to spend the bulk of our talk on today, non-IgE mediated, or a mixture of both that cause clinical symptoms. So these are the types of adverse food reactions. We're going to be focusing on the left here on immune mediated reactions, focusing mainly on IgE mediated food allergy. Non-IgE mediated reactions are important, but really just beyond the scope of our talk today. These include things like food protein induced enterocolitis or FPIs and mixed non-IgE and IgE conditions like eosinophilic GI disease, which are very important and really could have their own separate lectures, but really beyond what we can cover today. And then we have those non-immune mediated, which are typically known as food intolerances, that we have either a poor understanding of their mechanism or their metabolic or pharmacologic kind of side effects that we don't really quite always understand. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about that today, but uh, it's still considered an adverse food reaction. So when we look at those immunological food reactions, we have our IgE-mated food reactions, um, systemic allergic reactions, which can progress in severity to anaphylaxis. So we'll spend so much time talking about that. Then we have oral allergy syndrome or something also called food pollen syndrome, which I will mention in, a, in a, another slide or two. Um, that's a very important type of food allergy that we can see develop later in life and is actually Coming, becoming quite common. And then we've got our mixed features, um, our eosinophilic GI disease primarily, and then those non-IgE mediated conditions. I just want to mention a little bit about FPIs before we move on, because this is actually also increasing in prevalence, just like IgE mediated food allergies. So FPIs or food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome is a delayed, persistent, usually projectile aggressive violent vomiting that occurs usually several hours after ingestion, typically two to four hours after ingestion of a trigger food. And it's usually developing in infancy. And the most common foods involved are cow's milk or soy. A lot of these infants and babies will have previously tolerated the food and then suddenly develop this switch to, I, uh, to FPIs as well. And most children do outgrow this. We can also see solid food FPIs. Typically those are with grains and oats, um, but also fruits and nuts as well. Um, adult onset FPIs is not terribly common, but when we do see it, it's usually shellfish induced. So I just wanted to touch base on that. This is a condition that 
is increasing in prevalence as well and is often misdiagnosed as a viral gastroenteritis um, and very, very important that these patients get the right diagnosis. It's not IgE mediated. Um, epinephrine does not treat these reactions. Um, and thankfully there are no fatalities reported related to this condition. Um, but it's just important to know that that is a real um, immune mediated food reaction. So IgE mediated food allergy, those reactions are reproducible and they occur within minutes, typically up to two hours of ingestion of a food. It's unusual to have it beyond 30 minutes to an hour, but technically within two hours, it still falls within that window of what could be considered IgE mediated. And reactions can range from mild to severe all the way to anaphylaxis, which is obviously the most severe. It's a misconception that people can have either mild food allergies or severe food allergies every food allergy is severe and there can be a myriad of other things involved in that patient's life that can make the reaction be more severe one day as compared to the next day. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So there's no such thing as a mild or a severe food allergy. There, well, rather, there's no such thing as a mild food allergy. They're all severe. They're all severe. They all need to be considered severe because even if a patient has been historically what we call a high threshold responder where they can have trace reactions and or trace exposures that really cause mild reactions, they can with the perfect kind of combination of cofactors and other problems going on can actually have a severe reaction. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So those typical symptoms that we see are typically involving some type of cutaneous symptoms like urticaria or angioedema and itching. Over 90% of food allergic reactions will have hives or urticaria. We see respiratory involvement, especially in our asthmatic patients. They'll have cough, wheeze, shortness of breath accompanying those reactions. And then more severe symptoms leading to cardiovascular conditions as well developing. A lot of GI symptoms like vomiting or abdominal cramping in our female patients will often see really severe uterine cramps um, as a sign of anaphylactic or systemic allergic reactions. And then neurologically, of course, we can see severe symptoms like loss of consciousness, but we also have this anxiety or what we call sense of doom that can be very, very real. And if you're experienced in treating allergic food reactions or allergic reactions and anaphylaxis in general, we almost always develop some clinical gestalt where we can just eyeball a patient and know that patient's having anaphylaxis because they just have this look on their face. Something's not right. And they really struggle to describe the symptoms. Um, and that sense of doom is very, very real and very, very commonly something that we see in practice when we see anaphylactic reactions. <clears throat> so a little bit on oral allergy syndrome or food pollen allergy syndrome or pollen food syndrome. It's, it has a few different names with oral allergy syndrome being the most most common presentation and the most common term used. This is a very common type of late onset food allergy. And late onset food allergy in the allergy world is really like school age or older. Um, we're not necessarily talking about adults here. This is actually a syndrome that develops due to cross reactivity with a food and a corresponding pollen. So a lot of plant-based foods can actually share significant protein homology where if you think of it as, this is how I describe it to patients, if you think of it as looking under a microscope at pollen and the food, they look so identical, so similar. It's like one of those spot the difference kind of games where there's five different differences you have to find between these two photos and they look almost identical. They're so identical that your immune system who is primed to response to an allergen cannot tell the difference between them and reacts as if you're eating pollen. Literally, you put this in your mouth and you have some type of oral tingling, throat pruritus. Um, symptoms are typically mild and limited to the oral pharynx, but very rarely, about 2% of the time, we can see systemic reactions occur. Some patients will get rhinitis with this as well. Some patients get angioedema of the lips, um, but this is actually very, very common. There are a couple pollen families that are very closely related to this condition. Birch is one of them. And I listed the cross-reactive foods that are typically seen with birch. And as you can see, there's a lot there. On the next slide, we'll talk about some of the other common families. Typically how we manage this is we recommend avoidance of the raw food. Most of the time patients can tolerate the cooked or baked versions because that slightly changes the protein structure just enough that they don't have that recognition of their immune system thinking it's pollen. It looks a little bit different um, and they can tell the difference. So most patients can tolerate cooked versions, not all. And so typically we'll recommend avoiding the raw food. Many of our patients will still eat these foods, but um, this is a very common thing that we see. So on this next slide, these are some of the other families that we see related to this. Ragweed being quite common, 
causing issues with melons, banana, cucumber, um, orchard grass as well. Mugwort is another common one. We see, um, this is a common weed um, in the United States. We see that um, patients can develop mugwort um, related issues with various spices. And as you can imagine, this these things can be kind of hidden in food and not really be obvious that it's the culprit causing them their symptoms. Um, but this is a very common condition where it kind of has its own name called mugwort celery spice syndrome. So this was something that was really important to me to point out because as allergic diseases are on the rise, pollen seasons are getting longer and longer, especially in the northern latitudes of the United States. It's really important to know that, yes, this is a food allergy. It is a very real food allergy. And depending on the patient's symptoms, they may also be given a prescription for an EpiPen if they've had some more concerning reaction, especially involving the larynx. But this is something that we see often in the office. Testing doesn't always help us with this problem. Um, so we don't always do any type of testing on this unless a patient has had a more concerning reaction or a history that suggests it might not be food pollen syndrome. So really important thing I wanted to touch on before we dive dive into the regular classic food allergy. Next, really briefly on food intolerance. This is a term that encompasses really all the non-immune type food reactions. Complaints can be really variable and can include fatigue, brain fog, a lot of times GI complaints. We're all very familiar with lactose intolerance and other kinds of conditions related to that. Symptoms can not always be reproducible. They can be inconsistent. We can have delayed symptoms, sometimes hours to days later. There's no validated panel to diagnose food intolerances. So that's one of the key points we're gonna drive home. You're gonna hear that over and over again in this talk that there is no panel to diagnose food intolerances. The mechanisms are usually poorly understood. We know that these symptoms can be very, very severe. However, there's no test that can help us diagnose what food is causing the problem besides avoiding that food and trial introduction and, and elimination diets. So just a touch on that before we dive in. So now we're going to talk about the epidemiology of food allergy a little bit. So food allergies are thought to be uh, developing due to the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. So this is the leading hypothesis of why food allergies develop. So it makes immunologic sense that food exposure through a non-atopic primed gut with oral exposure in typically an infant or a toddler, where we have immune regulatory cells that are primed for tolerance, that will actually lead to tolerance to the food versus cutaneous skin exposure through typically atopic dermatitis in infants and toddlers, that is more primed towards a high, what we call TH2 inflammatory signal that's heavily related to development of allergy. So this picture kind of goes through that and I'll walk you through that again because we just went through all, quite a bit there. So we have our typical little baby or toddler with, with severe atopic dermatitis or eczema. Um, I'll use those words interchangeably. So they have eczema and they are exposed through the skin to food proteins that then drive that inflammatory response that we're seeing on the left and can actually create that food allergy. If they have had early introduction of that food and they've had enough oral exposure where that food is getting into their mouth and into their GI tract, that actually promotes tolerance. So there's a common misconception that food allergies cause eczema. And while they can be related, typically the theory is that eczema causes food allergy. Food allergy does not cause eczema, um, with very few exceptions to that. So this is really important to us where when we're explaining to patients and parents and our colleagues about really how does this develop. So it makes sense that we have a little toddler or let's say, you know, a six month old who has bad eczema, has never maybe introduced these foods and solids at all, has bad eczema, is referred to the allergy clinic um, because they had, you know, egg for the first time and they had um, a pretty uh, obvious IgE mediated allergy. And the parents are concerned, you know, they've never eaten this food. So I thought you had to be exposed to the food to develop an allergy. Well, guess what? This baby was exposed to the food. If the food was in the home, then that was found in detectable proteins throughout the home. And what are these babies doing? They're crawling around, they're playing on the floor. There are many studies that tell us that there's detectable food proteins, including peanut, in all parts of the house um, and in homes that contain these foods. So these kiddos are actually getting exposed through the faulty skin barrier related to their eczema. 
and they're developing the allergy before they even have oral in in introduction of that food. So this is kind of that leading theory. And then there's been many studies that tell us that infants with eczema are high risk. We'll talk a lot about that later on, but this is the general leading theory of how food allergies develop. Now, there are some people that don't have bad eczema that develop food allergy as well, but this is the leading theory behind all of that science. So something I wanted to touch on before we dive into the prevalence so looking at prevalence, food allergy affects up to 10% of children and 8% of adults. You'll see different estimates based on different study populations. Self-reports are much higher. So when we do self-reports where it's just a survey that's sent out to the mass pop population about if they have a food allergy or not, many people will report that they do when they actually don't. Um, and it's our job to give them the right education about that. Adult onset food allergy is actually seen in 15% of adults with food allergy. And typically, if we have adult onset food allergy, it's shellfish. That's the major culprit there. Over half of them will have shellfish allergy. Prevalence is increasing over the last several decades. There are a lot of reasons for that and a lot of theories, um, which we won't get into today. Um, but the prevalence and the patterns of the food allergies that we see differs quite a bit by geography, race, and ethnicity of the patient. We see different common food allergens in different parts of the world. For example, in the Middle East, where they have a lot of peanut-containing foods early in life, we do not actually see a lot of peanut allergy, but we may see more sesame allergy in places like the Middle East and Greece, for example. So that's just one of those things that we see dependent on cultural factors and geography. We know that food allergy is very likely under-recognized in racial and ethnic minorities, and that's really important for us to be aware of. And food allergy reactions are very common, with 42% of kids with food allergy having at least one lifetime ER visit related to a food reaction, and 19% of those having one within the last year. So this is a big burden for a lot of these families, not to mention the psychosocial impacts, but these reactions can be common. Looking at the prevalence of food allergy in U.S. children, and I said, of course, those estimates will differ depending on the study, that these are the top nine that we look at. Um, sesame was just added to the top nine allergenic foods. And as you can see, this estimate from this study is about 8%. And with peanut being the highest and going from peanut, tree nuts, milk, shellfish, egg, fin fish, wheat, soy, and sesame. And these are the top nine food allergens. It's technically possible to be allergic to any food, any food protein, but these are the ones that we're always most suspicious of that will represent over 95% of all food allergic reactions. And within that, almost 40% of food allergic children will have multiple food allergies. So let's talk a little bit about the natural history of some of these food allergies. So milk and egg, we're typically diagnosing early in life, as well as peanut in that infant toddler age. With milk and egg, we see almost half of those get uh, spontaneously resolved or outgrown over time, half of them by early school age, five or six years old. And many of these patients, no matter how allergic they are to scrambled egg or whole milk, let's say, a lot of them, 70 to 80% can actually tolerate extensively heated or baked milk, like in a muffin, let's say, or baked egg in a muffin or a cake or cupcake. So we really try to figure out who we can introduce that to and get that in the diet as soon as we can, because that can be a huge huge game changer to families that are avoiding the whole form of the food, but knowing that they can eat the baked food. And there's actually some evidence that tells us that that could uh, speed up the development of tolerance to the whole food allergy. Peanut and tree nut allergies, we tend to see um, less likely to be outgrown. Peanut about 20% of the time, tree nuts only about 10% of the time. Tree nut allergy can also be one of those that we'll see delayed more like toddlerhood and, and early childhood. One of the reasons for that is that they may not have been introduced prior to that um, unless a family has a strong um, dietary preference to have tree nuts involved in their diet. And then wheat, similar to the others listed above, we see a lot of resolution of this um, 50% by age seven. We're going to dive into the clinical history and diagnosis and probably spend the bulk of our hour on this. So we have a lot to cover here. So the diagnosis of food allergy, the clinical history is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. And if this is the first thing I want to drive home, clinical history, most important thing. The key elements that we look at are the timing. Was this a food reaction that developed within minutes, within 10 minutes, within 30 minutes, within an hour, within six hours, less likely to be IgE mediated. So the timing is super, super important. If that food was ingested before is also very important. The symptoms that occurred. So 
is that patient just getting a stomach ache uh, about 30 minutes after, or did that patient get a stomach ache plus hives, plus lip swelling, plus difficulty breathing, plus the significant anxiety, plus an episode of vomiting? You know, that's more consistent with IgE mediated reactions. We want to know information about the quantity of the food because that can give us insight on how much can this patient consume? Now, typically we're not just ad lib consuming these foods, even if they were able to tolerate a couple bites, but that's very important for kind of future care and, and guidance. And how was that food prepared? Was it raw? Was it baked? Um, was what else was kind of gone into that preparation? We want to know if it's reproducible. So did that food cause a reaction multiple times? Um, and sometimes families won't try it again, of course, if there was a concerning reaction. Um, but is if there is a story of, well, we tried that food, this happened, they got hives and lip swelling, we tried it again, a month later, same thing happened. That really seals the deal that this is very likely an IgE mediated food allergy. We also want to know about the treatment and the resolution of symptoms, how long it took to go away. It's really unusual that food allergic reactions last for several hours or several days. Most of them, even without treatment, will go away on their own. But we want to know what treatment was given. Was epinephrine given? And if it was, we would expect that, that those symptoms resolve pretty quickly. Um, so that's really important to know as well. And then we also need to know about the presence of various cofactors. So cofactors are those things that I mentioned earlier that if they're present around a reaction, that they can actually make reactions worse. So these are things like exercise, alcohol ingestion, certain medications, actually common medicines like NSAIDs can actually increase mast cell degranulation and make our patients more susceptible to react at lower doses or have a more intense allergic reaction. Those are just some of them. There's other things like uncontrolled asthma that would put patients at increased risk, but those are some big ones that we'll see kind of surrounding allergic reactions. There are actually some conditions that, that patients will only react if those things are present. So really important to get that history. And this is a point we're going to drive home a million times, but testing serves to confirm a suspected allergy based on history. So we're going to talk about this a lot, but if a patient comes into your office and they suspect they have a food allergy or a parent is in your office and they suspect their child had a food allergic reaction, if they have a laundry list of what the foods could be, it's very unlikely to be a food allergy. And I would go so far to say is the longer the list is, the less likely it is to be a food allergy because it is very obvious. You shouldn't have to think about it. It is a very obvious reaction. It's not just vague symptoms like a stomach ache. These are families and patients that are experiencing these awful IgE mediated events that are, it's very obvious what food it was. And if it's not, we can narrow it down usually to one or two. These babies and toddlers are not eating a huge wide variety of their diet typically, but we know based on the top foods, what's more likely. But if that list is very long and, and we hear the phrase, I don't know what it is, it's very unlikely to be food allergy. So that should be your first red flag that you should be getting that long um, detailed clinical history to really figure out is this patient kind of aligning with what we typically would expect with food allergy? So begins with the history. Again, symptoms within minutes to two hours of ingesting a food, reproducible. We already saw this chart. Um, symptoms typically include urticaria, some type of angioedema. We'll see hives or urticaria in over 95% of reactions, um, plus all these other symptoms that we mentioned. Another graphic that I use for a publication I was um, involved in a couple years ago, I created this um, and I just really like how it illustrates kind of everything that we see with the patient and what body parts are affected. Um, that sense of doom is listed next to CNS, um, altered mental status in infants and toddlers. We'll sometimes see when we're doing food challenges in the office that their demeanor changes. Now, sometimes that's just toddlerhood and them being sick of being in a doctor's office for a couple of hours. But um, if that was a child that was playing happily and then all of a sudden is super irritable, especially if they're inconsolable, that could be a sign that they're actually having a reaction. So we'll watch them pretty closely. Another thing I want to point out that was not listed on a previous slide was the ocular symptoms listed here. So ocular symptoms, when they're present following a food allergic reaction or exposure, they almost always correlate with a more severe reaction. So I am typically primed and seeing that, and it's in the literature, but seeing that in the office, if I have a kiddo with ocular symptoms, we're not just talking angioedema of the eyelids, we're talking actual conjunctival injection and itching and redness and watering, that's almost always a sign that there's a more serious reaction going on. And I'll typically go straight to epinephrine. I don't even need to know what else is going on with that patient. They get epi because we've seen that too much um, correlate with a more severe reaction. Most of those patients end up needing epinephrine. 
So what are some things that are unlikely to be food allergy? So atopic dermatitis or eczema, there's an asterisk next to that because it's correlated with food allergy, but food allergies don't really cause it. It's, it's associated with food allergic conditions. And as we know from the dual allergen exposure hypothesis, patients with AD or eczema are more likely to get food allergies. They're more high risk. So I have an asterisk next to that one because I don't like to speak in absolutes about AD never being related. It's less likely to be caused by a food. Contact urticaria I also have a star next to this as well, um, because we can see contact urticaria be related to an IgE-mediated food allergy, but most often how this shows up, and we probably have all heard this story, uh, a little kid, a toddler, typically a baby was given, you know, mashed up berries or something, and they eat like this, you know, the hands are all over their face and, and it gets all over their mouth, right? They're not the neatest eaters. We know that. So what can happen is they have a pretty gnarly breakout on their face and it can look really bad. Uh, so that parent gets super freaked out and says, holy cow, no way they're allergic to this food. Well, we know that berries are unlikely to be in the top producing allergens, right? And what we do know is that the acidic nature of some of these foods can actually just cause skin to break out, especially if you have a really, really young child with very sensitive skin. So most of the time, this is not an IgE mediated food allergy. And I'll typically ask parents two questions. Did they love the food? Because kiddos, if they're allergic, they're also typically feeling something inside their mouth as well. And they will have a natural aversion to that food. I can't tell you how many times I've diagnosed food allergy just based on a parent telling me he's always refused eggs, he's always refused that. So if they liked it and they kept eating it, then they're very unlikely to be allergic. But we understand why the food was then withheld until they had further evaluation. The other thing is that one of the ways that we'll um, approach this is we'll talk to parents about offering some type of barrier cream where we'll usually use something like Vaseline or Aquaphor, like a thick emollient that they put on the cheeks and the face of the baby before they eat the food because that acts as a barrier. So their skin is not, not likely to break out. And if they're not going to break out, then we know it's just contact urticaria, which like I said, can, can look really extreme, but it doesn't necessarily correlate that anything internally is going bad. Another thing I want to point out is that another misconception, we're going to do a lot of myth busting and, and talking about that today, putting a food on the skin does not diagnose food allergies. So we still hear this a lot, despite lots of education, that that's not how we diagnose food allergy. But we have a lot of parents that are told, well, you know, our primary care doctor, pediatrician said, go ahead and rub it on the skin before giving it to them and see if they break out. So yes, we can see contact reactions with some exposure on the skin that does not correlate with systemic reactions. We just learned that. But also if we don't see a skin reaction, that doesn't mean that they're not gonna react when they ingest. So it's completely useless and pointless to do that. So don't do that and stop recommending that to your patients. Um, so another thing I wanted to point out there, when hives last more than a few hours, especially if it's over a day or if they come back multiple days in a row, that's not a food allergy. Reactions that occur only sporadically when the food is ingested, typically not a food allergy as well. Um, headaches, hyperactivity, mood changes. Um, there's just not a lot of evidence that this is this type of food allergy. Now, it's beyond the scope of my practice to say if there is any other mechanism involved with foods causing some other conditions, um, neurological conditions, let's say. But from a traditional IgE mediated standpoint, no, this is not a thing that we see. And then chronic nasal congestion or rhinorrhea, not associated with IgE mediated food allergy with the exception of right after that food is ingested, of course. There is a, another condition that we'll treat a lot called gustatory rhinitis, where people will actually get quite a bit of rhinorrhea after they eat. Uh, that's not actually a food allergy. It's a different type of mechanism really involving the tissues and neuro, neuro processes in the nose and the nasal cavity um, and very treatable. So everyone's probably experienced a little bit of that where when we eat spicy foods, our nose run, that's actually goose, a version of gustatory rhinitis um, or vasomotor or non-allergic rhinitis, but not IgE mediated food allergy. So I always include this poster in every food allergy talk that I do because this is probably the poster, forget asthma inhalers, forget um, food allergy action plans or anaphylaxis charts. This is probably the poster that I would need to refer to the most in my clinic. Um, and it's a joke, of course, but we have a lot of consults saying, I want food allergy testing for my eczema, which you'll learn that's not appropriate. But what we want to say, and we are very empathetic and, and very, um, uh, very uh, educational when we talk to our patients, but we want to say is it's not a food allergy. It's a barrier dysfunction. We control the skin. Your eczema will go away. It's not a food causing this. So I just wanted to include this as a little joke. 
All right, diagnostics and food allergy. So we've got skin prick testing, we've got serum specific IgE testing, we've got IgE component testing, and then we have our gold standard oral food challenge. Typically a double blind placebo controlled food challenge is the gold standard to diagnose a food allergy, but we often do not have to go that far because we use our clinical history plus testing results to confirm a food allergy, but we'll talk about all of these. So both skin prick testing and serum IgE testing, which used to be called RAS testing based on the radioassorbent assay test that was done, that's an outdated term. So it's IgE testing. Um, that's what we call it now. So RAS is, is an old term, but really when people use that term, they're referring to IgE testing now. They are tools that show IgE mediated sensitivity to a particular food, but a positive test does not equal food allergy. So we need that history. The testing number on the IgE test, how high that number is, or the size of the wheel does not predict severity of the food reaction, or it does not predict the dose that would cause a reaction. There's no way for us to test to that. There are tests called epitope testing and basophil activation tests that can give us a little bit more insight there, but they're not widely available. There's one available for peanut, but it costs over a thousand dollars for parents to do, and it's not really something that we typically are discussing with our patients. So in general, there's no way to predict the severity of food reactions. I so wish I could provide that information to families, um, but instead we just educate about other things. But uh, that's a challenge that we, and a hurdle that we have in food allergy. There's no way to predict the severity. The severity is really just based on previous reactions, honestly. Testing should only be done to the foods of concern and panel testing should never, ever, ever, ever be ordered. There is zero clinical indication to ever order a full food panel. They can cause more harm than good. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. In no matter what type of testing we see, serum IgE testing or skin prick testing, there's poor specificity and poor reliable positive predictive values, but high sensitivity. So what that means for those of you that don't remember statistics from, from our undergrads, Poor specificity means that a positive, we see a lot of false positives, basically. Negatives, we don't see a lot of false negatives. We tend to really trust negatives. So that's really comforting when we see a negative test. The NIAID guidelines recommend that skin prick testing and serum IgE testing are only done in his, where there's a history of suspicious for food allergy, IgE mediated food allergy, but the skin prick test alone cannot be considered diagnostic of food allergy. And the serum IgE testing alone is not diagnostic of food allergy. These are not screening tests. They do not tell us yes or no. Um, they, they really need the history and full food panels often do more harm than good. And we'll talk a lot more about that. So this is my disclaimer slide. This is probably the most important slide in this entire talk before we dive into more specifics about skin testing and IgE testing. Broad food panels should never, ever be ordered. It's easy. You've got a patient in your office, a worried parent. You click order. You've got, you're have got you running behind. You've got three patients waiting to see you. It's easy to just click full food panel. Please stop doing it. Just order the foods of concern. And if you don't know what foods caused it, then now you know that it's very unlikely to be a food allergy. Send them to us and we can give them the guidance there. There's no clinical indication, no diagnosis that warrants ordering full food panels, period, full stop. It's against the guidelines and the standard of care. They are not screening tests and they can be harmful. And I want to highlight this here. Full food panels can be extremely harmful. And a lot of people might roll their eyes or balk at this statement, but they can be. And I'll tell you why. So we can have an infant who has bad eczema, for example. They have a full food panel done. Guess what? Babies with bad eczema, they pop up positive to every food. That family now has to wait till they see a specialist and have no idea what they can feed their child. They might be going to very expensive elemental formulas in the meantime because they don't know what else to feed their kid. There's significant stress. There's growth concerns. There are literally cases of kiddos getting significant vitamin deficiencies like scurvy or Corsicor because of unnecessary food avoidance. And it can be harmful in the sense, not only for the nutritional growth of the child and the psychosocial impact, but also food allergy related diets are very expensive. So we see that economic and financial impact towards the family members. Typically it affects the whole family because if one child is going on this diet, 
just for uh, safety reasons, the whole family might follow this diet, but they can actually be harmful in the sense that you can actually impact the development of food allergy in these patients. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So we know the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. We just talked about that, where if an infant has too much cutaneous exposure that primes for allergy before they have too much oral exposure that primes for tolerance, we can actually tip the scales one way or the other. And in this case, if a food is eliminated from the diet, they are no longer getting that oral exposure that promotes tolerance. So that tips the scales that now they're only getting cutaneous exposure. And literally in just those two months, one month that they waited to get into the allergy office, they can become IgE allergic when they weren't. So they have a provider who did a full food panel who told them they were allergic and pulled the food, even though there was no other history, no hives, no lip swelling, no difficulty breathing, nothing else that suggested IgE allergy. Now that food's out of the diet, and we have a child now who was not going to ever have an anaphylactic food reaction, maybe, most likely, now they have IgE-mediated food allergy. We see this all the time, guys. It's a big deal. So you've got a kiddo, a family who's already stressed out. They're waiting to see a specialist. They don't know what to feed their kid. And guess what? You, ordering a full food panel, cause them to get IgE-mediated food allergy for the rest of their life, most likely, if especially if we're talking about peanut. Um, that's a high likelihood of not remitting spontaneously over time. So I, I know this might be difficult to hear, and there's a lot of emotion surrounding this, but I cannot stress this enough. It can be harmful. You can literally alter the course of someone's life and their entire family's life. This is a big deal. So we need to stop ordering full food panels. They are extremely harmful. They should never be ordered. That's all I have to say about that for now. So how early in life can skin testing be completed? This is another big misconception that we address all the time in the allergy practice. We often have delayed referrals to our practice from whichever, you know, primary care or pediatrics because of the reason, you know, when I ask families, like, gosh, you know, why didn't you come in sooner, you know, when this all started? And we'll be told, oh, well, our, our provider said that we couldn't do skin testing until four years old, until two years old, until six years old. We've heard it all over. It's ridiculous. You know how early we can do skin testing? We literally can do skin testing in the delivery room. We can do skin testing on newborns. We don't have to. There's no clinical indication to need to do this usually, but we can do skin testing as early as we need to. And because early intervention is very important in these babies, we do not want to see a delay in referral to our office. The earliest I've done skin testing is on uh, about a, a 12 week old um, in a in a patient who was high risk, who wanted, who needed the screening test before we introduced peanut. And we were able to introduce that at four months, just a month after we did the skin test. So if your patient, if you suspect they have a food allergy, do not delay allergy referral. And even if we choose for whatever reason not to do skin testing at the first visit, we can do it later. We can still get the story and still give really good guidance here. So skin testing, any age. So how does skin prick testing work? We take the allergenic extract, it's applied to the surface of the skin via a skin prick. It's like a little plastic toothpick device that we typically use. And that area is observed for 15 minutes. When that 15 minute timer goes off, we come in and we measure the wheel and the flare as notated in this photo here, the wheel being the, the little you know uh, hive there and then the flare being the surrounding erythema. This actually measures IgE bound to cutaneous mast cells by causing mast cell degranulation on the surface of the skin. And we know that that can just be positive and false positives. We see that all the time. We talked about how there's poor specificity um, for both um, skin testing and, and IgE testing, but this is typically what we're measuring here, this IgE on cutaneous mast cells in the skin. In general, a wheel greater than or equal to three millimeter is considered positive, but again, does not always mean allergy. The larger the skin test is means nothing about severity, but the larger the skin test is makes it more likely that it's a true allergy. And a negative test, like we talked about, is very reliable. So we're really happy when we see negatives. We really do trust them. Serum-specific IgE testing is a little bit different. It detects the presence of food-specific IgE antibodies in the serum by taking the patient's serum and kind of mixing it up with the food there. It could be more useful than skin prick testing when we're using predictive cutoff values, which we'll get to in a second. But these reports have a lot of flaws as well. So these classes, so if you've ever seen one of these full food reports, you know, because you're not going to order them anymore. So they're going to be ordered by another provider. Um, but if you ever see these come in, you're going to see that there's this number that's listed, right? And none of these are especially high. There's really not much on this patient's 
full food panel that we know she didn't need, but there's not much that really stands out to me as super concerning. But these class levels that are reported on labs, we don't know why they're there, okay? They don't mean anything. They don't mean anything. So we'll have patients that will say to us, oh, I'm a class four to this, I'm a class three to that. That means nothing to us. We really need to see the number, the number itself. So the KU per liter that's reported here. Um, what's very interesting is that the cutoff points are typically 0.35 of what's considered uh, negative versus positive. But recently we've had increased, increased kind of diagnostic accuracy with some foods like peanut, where this actually can be a lower cut point to 0 0.10. So the labs decided to change that to every food it has now a cut point of 0 0.10 when we know that doesn't really clinically correlate with allergies. So what happens, a family gets this panel, right? And there could be any foods listed here. This is like a weird fruit panel, um, but most of the time, it's a panel that has all the common foods on there plus some and uh what will happen is there's a bright red bold h or exclamation point next to that number and then it has a class number and then that parent that patient's terrified or that parent's terrified to introduce the food so this is just part of the stress of doing these panels that aren't indicated um but you know when we see these kind of results they don't matter when i see a patient that comes in with a full food panel I don't care. I want the history first and then I'll look at this. And we know that most of this is hogwash and doesn't really mean anything to us because a food panel is never indicated. But then after getting the history, I can go back to the lab test. And I do like to phrase it in this way to patients. If you didn't have the testing done, because you know, the testing can influence our belief systems, right? And patients have very strong belief systems about what's causing their symptoms, but it's our jobs to educate them properly, but in a very empathetic way. And there can be a lot of mo emotion tied into this. So I like to tell patients and parents, ignore the test, pretend it's hard to do this, but pretend you've never had the test done what would be your suspicion? And, you know, sometimes they'll tell me, I have no idea, right? And then we know it's probably not a food allergy. Sometimes they'll tell me, egg, egg's the only one I'm concerned about in my son. Okay, then we focus on that and we talk more about that and kind of our, uh, our discussion expands beyond that. So just something I wanted to point out with the lab tests and how the, the test report alone can induce significant anxiety. All right, let's talk about predictive values. So predictive values are helpful values that have been throughout research studies shown to be more likely to correlate with clinical allergy. And there are definitely outliers to this, but we use a lot of clinical values um, like this when we're trying to figure out if a patient may have outgrown their allergy, they have a suspicious history, but we're not quite sure because there were other things involved, or if they had a full food panel, of course, and we're trying to clean up the mess from that full food panel. So we use a lot of, um, for specific IgE testing, we use the 95% pre positive predictive value. So for all these foods, we have a value that we know in most studies has been shown to correlate where 95% of those patients with that level or higher will truly have clinical allergy, but there are always outliers. So I'm gonna point out a few to you here. So cow's milk, that cut point is typically 15, but some studies have also pointed 32. In infants, it's lower. Same thing with egg, seven, and then infants, it's lower. Peanut, it's a, quite a broad range, but in general, we kind of follow the 15 um, KU per liter um, cut point. Uh, what's interesting about this is that through research studies with OIT, when they've actually given patients the food and measured what dose they reacted to before doing oral immunotherapy to measure how effective it is at improving um, or lessening someone's clinical reactivity, they would challenge all of these kids where they would, regardless of their test result, they had to prove that that patient was allergic to prove, of course, that the therapy was effective. So there are numerous reports of kiddos testing above 100, the highest the tests go at the typical commercial lab is 100 or higher, kids will have 99s, 50s, 100 or greater, and still be able to eat the food. So this just illustrates how we can't rely on testing alone. Um, for fish and tree nuts, it's about 20-ish, um, and sesame, um, less reliable cut point um, at only about 86% positive predictive value. The 50% positive, or sorry, negative predictive values are sometimes helpful if we're considering an oral challenge. We'll start to consider an oral challenge when we think somebody's approaching that 50-50 mark, where we know they're clinically 
clinically allergic based on their history and their previous testing results, but we think there could be a chance that they're outgrowing it. And then skip prick testing, we use different cut points for that. Um, and it kind of varies based on the food. Um, it can be a little all over the map with the, the tree nuts, whereas walnut is eight, 12 for cashew. Um, we're typically using seven or eight clinically for most of the tree nuts. But um, just wanted to include this slide to point out that we do have some help with kind of predictive values there, but the predictive values are only as good as the population studied. So if we have predictive values from Asia, let's say, there's a lot of food allergy research out of Japan. If we have a predictive value in that patient population, primarily Asian or Japanese descent, we're going to see very likely a different predictive value in United States with, um, you know, hopefully a mix of different minorities, but um, most research studies are predominantly Caucasian Americans of, of Western European descent. So the numbers are going to be different. Um, so it's important to take all of these with a grain of salt, but know that clinical history still remains paramount and most important. Component testing is another thing that um, we typically will use uh, in the allergy clinic to help enhance our diagnostic accuracy. These are more specific proteins found within the food protein itself that have been shown to correlate with clinical reactivity. So some of them are what we call seed storage proteins. Some of them are profilins. Some of these foods um, will have significant um, airborne allergen kind of uh, homologous protein share like we talked about with oral allergy syndrome. So some of these studies can actually help us figure out, is this patient just testing positive because they the food share similar, team, similar protein structure with a pollen that they're allergic to? Or are they testing positive because of the tree nuts share a little bit of cross reactivity and are they clinically allergic? So it can be really helpful. Um, this is slightly outdated. What's now available as well is sesame components, which we use a lot because sesame testing is not super reliable. Um, so I use a lot in my practice. I love components. Um, but this also can help us um, figure out if for egg and milk, if they can tolerate the baked version of that food. So we use these cut points a lot to kind of give us a little bit more diagnostic insight. Um, but sometimes just based on history and the initial test alone, that's all we need. All right, oral food challenge, they're the gold standard for the diagnosis of food allergy. They need to be performed at centers that are comfortable with handling anaphylaxis, so typically the allergy clinics and um, hospital-based clinics as well. And the gold standard is actually the double-blind placebo-controlled oral food challenge. But in the real world, we're typically doing what we call open food challenges, where the double-blind one, of course, if you remember from um, randomized controlled trials and reading the literature, double-blind is when both the practitioner and the patient do not know what they're getting. Single blind is when only the patient doesn't know what they're getting. And open is when everyone knows what you're getting. So they bring in the food and we introduce it in increments. We'll talk a little bit about how that works. We do single blind studies when we think that someone may have reacted, but we don't see physical symptoms, let's say. So a good example would be if there's significant anxiety involved in eating the food. You've got you know, an eight-year-old that you think might have outgrown their peanut allergy, but they've been told their whole life to avoid this, and they've been very fearful of allergic reactions. They might even remember having a very severe allergic reaction. So it sometimes can play a big role, the anxiety part of this in these food challenges. So what we'll typically do in those scenarios, we'll start with an open open challenge. And if we think that the patient had reported symptoms, but we don't see anything physically, their vital signs are stable. We don't see any overt signs of allergic reaction, objective signs, let's say, but the patient's reporting something. Um, let's say um, sometimes it can be uh, throat irritation, um, something that's a little nonspecific, but we can't see. Um, then we'll sometimes stop the challenge. Sometimes we'll keep going. We'll talk it out. But in those instances where we think anxiety could play a big role, we'll do a single blinded challenge where we'll mix up the food and mask the taste and odor with something else. Um, and there's a lot of publications that kind of help with these practical aspects of that. The main reasons to do a food challenge is to determine whether the wrong food is the cause of the symptoms or the right cause, actual cause of the symptoms, to prove that a food is not the cause of symptoms. So we do that a lot. We have a lot of patients that come to us um, with a full food panel done. Typically, we know they don't have clinical food allergy, but even in our adult patients, they're very fearful about reintroducing this food. So to add to another harm is the financial burden and time work lost because of them coming into our office to do these time consuming oral food challenges because they are scared to eat the food. And we never want a patient to be afraid to introduce a food. When we hear stories about patients going to the ER to feed their kid a food that they could have an allergic reaction to and sitting in the ER parking lot, just in case, that's ridiculous. We'd rather just do it in the office. So 
another reason why food panels should not be done because there's that huge fear that can kind of be interpreted um, based on those results. And that patient is now afraid to introduce it at home, even though we know it in, in, in all the evidence and in our hearts that that patient's going to be fine, but we do it in the office all the time to prove that they're not allergic. Um, we can also do food challenges primarily. This is when we'll do them to verify whether a patient has outgrown their food allergy and is now tolerant to that food. And then also to discover the degree of sensitivity, which we don't really do in practice, um, but that's more in the research setting before they do food related, uh, food allergy related studies. Um, but really the decision to undergo a food challenge is a combination of the history and diagnostic testing and ultimately a shared decision. And that's a, obviously a big buzz buzzword phrase that we hear a lot, but really there are some instances where we know that a patient may not be allergic. We want to introduce it. They've had very low level equivocal testing, let's say, and we really encourage them to do it because that can offer the freedom that they they, they didn't previously have, and they don't have to worry about eating that food. But in some situations, that's not that meaningful to a family. And I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody has cashew and pistachio allergy. They often coexist. They're very closely related. They're pretty much like sibling nuts. Um, so they'll typically coexist. And a patient with cashew pistachio allergy may decide to go their whole life avoiding all tree nuts. And even though they know they may not be allergic to tree nuts, and that's fine if that's not affecting their quality of life in an adverse way outside of the norm with food allergy. But in those instances, that patient may never care about eating tree nuts because they just prefer to avoid all tree nuts. And it's not going to add significant value to that patient's life to do that challenge other than knowing I can eat this food. But in the real world, as they navigate life with their food allergy, they're still going to prefer to avoid all nuts because that keeps them safe from cross-contamination or things like that. So that's just kind of a practical tip of sometimes we'll get patients referred to do food challenges. And sometimes it's just not practical to, to have them come in the office, spend three hours of their time, miss school, parents miss work when it doesn't really matter to them. We always encourage it because we ultimately are the clinic that want to know for sure, but um, a lot of times they'll forego it and that's up to them. So food challenges, like I said, we typically do open oral food challenges. It's the most commonly thing, uh, commonly used type in the clinical setting where they know what they're getting, we know what they're getting. We typically take the age appropriate serving size of the food and then cut it into kind of chunks as notated here below. Most of the time we're doing the four dose protocol. So when we do oral food challenges, we're usually pretty confident that the patient's going to do well. We've been humbled of course, by having some reactions um, in the office multiple times, but um, um, we typically do think they're going to do quite well. So we'll cut that dose into chunks as kind of notated by this graph here. So let's say they're bringing in a muffin for a baked muffin challenge. We'll give them the recipe to follow ahead of time. And we'll give them a 12th of that muffin followed by a six, followed by a quarter, and then a half. And then monitor them for one hour after the last dose to monitor for any allergic reaction. Um, sometimes if they have had a history of delayed reactions, we'll keep them a little bit longer. The six dose protocol is when we might have a little bit heightened concern that the patient might react. And this may be in a situation where the family is very motivated to do the challenge, but their testing results are a little bit more suspicious. Eh, this could be a food allergy um, based on their history. So we'll often follow the six dose protocol for maybe more um, concerning histories. Also, I'm in Jacksonville. We have a strong, um, very high level of uh, military population here. And for children or kids rather um, to enroll in the military, um, they actually will often have to do an oral food challenge in the office, even if we know their clinical history reports or suggests that they are truly allergic and their testing confirms that. Um, but the military, before they can enroll, will often require us to do some type of test to see really at what level do they react. So for those patients, when we're really suspicious that they're going to react, um, we will just do the six dose protocol, give them a super teeny tiny amount because we have strong suspicion that they will have some symptoms and that just keeps them safer. So unproven or disproven tests for food allergy. This is, we're going to be on the slide for a while because this is super, super important. These, all these tests listed here are huge scams. Um, and I would go so far to say that even allergy testing that seems legitimate, that's done by a non-allergist or a practitioner that's not under the oversight of a board certified allergist is inappropriate. And so we're going to go through some of these. So IgG testing is a test that claims that can diagnose food sensitivities. Um, there are a lot of brands out there, but Everlywell is the big one that is um, everywhere. You can find it at the at the market at Target. You can find it on Amazon. And they market that they can find the reason for all of these myriad of complaints and things related to uh, obvious food intolerance. And 
what IgG testing is, what's really interesting about IgG testing is that it actually is a marker of tolerance. So when we do food allergy studies and we monitor if somebody is becoming tolerant to their food through oral immunotherapy, let's take a kiddo with peanut allergy, for example, their IgE, their allergic allergy antibody to peanut will actually decrease over time as they have introduced the peanut and becoming a little bit tolerant to that food, but their IgG rises because they're becoming tolerant to that food. So IgG means nothing except for you've been exposed to that at some point in time. And guess what? You also may be tolerant to that food. We know there's no um, pathology that it really diagnoses besides just giving a marker of exposure and tolerance. So what happens is these tests are done. A patient comes in with this huge kind of map of or, or printout um, of all of these tests. And sometimes they want me to interpret them and I just throw them in the trash, honestly. It's 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 a scam, complete scam. But um, I'm, I'm nice about at least explaining why this test is not uh, indicated or legitimate. And I explain that all to them. And and a lot of times they, they very much understand. But these tests are extremely expensive. They cost hundreds of dollars and also lead to unnecessary stress, financial burden, anxiety, extra doctor's visits to confirm things that fear, all those things we already talked about. Um, Everly Well is probably the most uh, well-known brand, but there are a lot out there. Um, full disclosure, I've been blacklisted from Everly Well because I have come after them on social media um, and written letters to them about how it's not evidence-based. Most of the allergy societies have also done. There are some class action lawsuits involving them, and there are also moves to kind of ban these products from being available to the general public. So um, if that doesn't tell you anything, um, I don't know what will. So uh, that, moving on, um, provocation neutralization testing. This is something that, you know, I don't quite understand, but it's typically done by alternative medicine practitioners. A lot of chiropractors do this who have no, um, no, uh, education to properly diagnose food allergies and they're practicing way out of their scope of practice. And what this is, is the theory that you can give a small amount of the antigen or allergen, and then a little bit more doses over time to um, cause some tolerance, but they do this in a different way. That's not really scientifically based. Um, I don't know much about that method. Um, I don't spend a lot of my time learning these different methods because most of them are scammy, but I do have a lot of familiarity with the ones that are commonly done. Um, intradermal food testing is when we actually take the food extract or other providers take the food extract and put it underneath the surface of the skin um, to try to elicit a response. This is actually very dangerous. If somebody does truly have an IgE mediated allergy, they can have a systemic allergic reaction to this. So that also, just like we know, regular skin testing or IgE testing panels are not indicative of food allergy. This does not prove anything either. LCAT testing, um, it's an acronym. I don't, I don't recall exactly what those letters mean, but the way this testing is done, um, they mix a patient's serum with white blood cells and measure the change in white blood cell volume. And they tell you that that is related to these foods that, that you're ingesting that's increasing white blood cell activity. And, you know, even though that process, they'll kind of give you a value and, and on a lab report. And even though that process seems like legitimate, there's no actual data or science that tells us that a change in white blood cells is pathologic in any way. Our immune systems respond to things all the time, good and bad. Um, so that doesn't correlate with any actual food allergy pathology. They have done numerous studies. I left the full uh, reference at the bottom of this slide. So you guys can look at one of the best reviews of this, but they've done numerous studies on LCAT testing where they've actually sent um, different results. I'm sorry, same results from the same people to these labs, you know, where they've done the test and everything, and they actually got completely different results. They also did tests, tests where they gave patients um, a diet that was actually recommended by the LCAT testing um, people, companies, and a placebo diet made up results. And the patients in the placebo group did better. So we know that this is not legitimate for numerous reasons. Um, the LCAT website makes a lot of claims and a lot of the studies that they say support their evidence uh, are very faulty. The methods are extremely you know, suspicious and um, just not something, not how a scientific method is intended to be done. Um, electrodermal testing is one of the more ridiculous ones. This is where um, someone holds a food and they get like a shock put through their body and uh, it just sounds ridiculous, right? And they, however, I guess that impedance is measured and however 
the timing is on that indicates allergy. It just sounds like bogus, right? This is something that's done by alternative medicine practitioners. And again, it's usually naturopaths, chiropractors. And I will say, sometimes some of these tests are ordered by well-meaning providers, just not understanding it. And that's why sharing this lecture is going to be super important. But this is something that's really only done in those kinds of settings. It's just absolutely ridiculous. There's no correlation of electrical impulses playing any role in this. Um, applied kinesiology or muscle testing is my absolute favorite. Um, this is where you hold a vial of the food and you put your arms out like this in a T and then the practitioner pushes down on your arms. And if you're weaker on one side that's holding the food, then the sample placebo vial, then that means you have a food allergy. Super sketchy, right guys? This is just like completely pseudoscience. So not a thing. Hair analysis is another thing that's been um, tested and proven to be um, not reliable, where you send in samples of your hair to a lab and they tell you what you're allergic to. Um, they have also done studies on this where they've sent the same person's hair samples to the same lab um, and got under different names and aliases and got different results. It's just completely, there's no science behind any of these things. And of course, on this list, we could add in full food panels, obviously. Um, and I would also add in any testing done by a non-allergy group um, is always very suspicious as well. Um, we don't know where they're getting their extracts from. We don't know what their training is. Um, it's just preferable to see an allergist um, or allergy provider. So um, a lot on this slide, but and a lot to digest. And again, this can be a very emotionally um, charging subject um, because there are a lot of providers that do this out there and make a lot of bold claims, um, but they're complete scams. So please stay away from these. All right, moving on to management of food allergy. So in general, general management principles of food allergy is avoidance of the food allergen. This has an asterisk next to it because we'll talk about situations where we may not fully avoid the food allergen. Um, one of those situations you've learned about already, like oral allergy syndrome, some patients can still eat the food, especially in cooked form. We want to ensure that nutritional needs are met, especially in littles with multiple food allergies. So almost all of my patients with milk allergy um, at a young age, they get referred to a dietitian. We really wanna make sure it's a registered dietitian and not someone that says they're a nutritionist. Um, of course, Many nutritionists are RDs, but we do not want to refer to someone who um, claims to be a nutritionist and only did like a 400 hour degree online where they got a certificate and they're just not qualified to help in these scenarios. So refer to dietary um, for some help. <clears throat> and in patients with poor growth, eating disorders that can develop in patients with food allergies, and especially those infants with multiple food allergies, that's very important, especially if it's a very important early life nutrient rich food like milk, wheat, egg, those are important to consider um, referral to a dietitian. Sometimes a dietitian just sees them once and says, yeah, I think this family's good. Um, other times they do um, have provide ongoing care. Education is big. So educating the patient on how to use their epinephrine auto injector, how to recognize allergic reactions, cross-contamination, label reading, true actual risk of allergic reactions. All these things we'll talk about in a little bit. Risk assessment for severe or fatal outcomes. So patients that are at risk of a more severe or fatal outcome, thankfully, thank goodness, fatal food allergic reactions are extremely uncommon. Um, we'll see some data on, I think the next slide about this, but it's what everyone's biggest fear is, of course, parents and patients with food allergy, but there are some things that predispose patients to be at risk for especially severe or fatal outcomes. And those are patients with uncontrolled asthma, situations where there was a delayed use of epinephrine, if a patient has a prior life-threatening reaction, but also the most important group here with the highest rates of severe outcomes are our adolescent and young adult populations. There are numerous reasons why we can see this, but these are typically our high school, college age kids with food allergy. There's this sense of invincibility a lot in these patients. They don't remember. It's been so long. They've been avoiding their food. And it might have been when they were an infant. They don't remember how bad the reaction was. They've been fine for years, haven't had any exposures that triggered reactions, which is great. But we see a lot of risk-taking behavior at this age. And of course, sometimes it's a social thing. There's a social stigma. They don't want to carry their epinephrine auto-injector. Sometimes it's because they're engaging in other risk-taking behaviors like drinking um, or just poor decision-making overall. Um, a lot of survey data has been done on adolescents and young adults with food allergy. And you would be shocked to hear how many people do not carry their epinephrine auto-injector. 
Um, but also how many people have knowingly ingested their allergen for fear of social stigma if they talked about having a food allergy. So we really need to make sure we're counseling these patients properly. Many of these patients don't really engage with us much in the office, of course, when we see them, but it's really important that you talk to the patient about this because they're used to hearing it from their parents. Um, we know how that can be. But if we as a provider say, hey, you just got to carry this, you know, these are the things that we're worried about. And you just have that point blank discussion with them that can be extremely important and potentially could save a life. We also want to make sure they have a food allergy emergency action plan. We'll talk about that as well. And then prescriptions and access to their epinephrine auto injectors. So for avoidance. We recommend complete avoidance of the food allergen with those exceptions in pollen food syndrome and patients who can maybe tolerate the baked product containing egg or milk. And of course, another exception here are patients undergoing food oral immunotherapy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act was established in 2004 and requires that the nine major food allergens, it used to be eight, but now we added sesame, the nine major food allergens need to be clearly labeled in bold in layman's terms. It can't say whey or casein. It has to say milk in bold and capital letters. Um, every country has kind of different rules with this, but in the U.S. it's the top nine that we talked about earlier. We also need to caution our families and patients about the advisory warning labels. This always blows everyone's mind, but those um, labels may contain process in a facility, made on share equipment. They mean nothing. And they're really just like lawyer speak for like, hey, heads up, this could have trace exposure, um, but they mean nothing. And there's been numerous studies that tell us that a lot of these products can have trace exposure to the food with that presence of that food allergen being common peanut in 7% of those things that say may contain or process in a facility with peanut and milk being a whopping 42%. What's great is that the majority of our patients that have a food allergy, thankfully, do not react to super trace amounts. Um, but this is still a risk. So whether avoidance of these products with these labels is really necessary is quite debatable. And it's kind of like a thing where we discuss with families and we just inform them that it's a risk. I have numerous patients that do not avoid these foods. I have had a peanut allergy my whole life. I eat these foods as well. Obviously, being in my field, I have higher self-efficacy at managing a reaction. But a lot of that goes into this discussion. It's a very nuanced discussion. But the biggest thing is that we need to make sure our families know that there is risk with this. And then cross-contamination, dessert and ice cream shots, buffets, bakeries, Asian restaurants, especially if they have tree nut or shellfish allergy, um, anything with shared equipment like fryers, that's where we can see some cross-contamination. Um, ice cream parlors are notorious. Um, places that make like smoothies and shakes, those are also high risk. So our patients, especially with like milk and tree nut allergies, need to be very aware with the, about that as well. So our food allergy emergency action plan is intended to provide guidance for medication administration based on the patient's symptoms and their history, and this should be really reviewed annually by their provider. Um, we can also recommend emergency identification bracelets for those patients in case they were ever found, you know, down related to a reaction or, or out and about with somebody that or with nobody that knows their food allergy exists. Um, there are several allergy action plans available. We probably most widely use is this one from FAIR, which is the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis uh, Food Allergy Research and Education website, um, fairfoodallergy.org, um, cited here below. But there's numerous. Um, every school district also seems to have one, but we provide this to every patient every year that has food allergy, as well as our newly diagnosed. And it goes through you know, if the patient has asthma, if they're more high risk for a severe reaction, what are those severe symptoms? When does epi need to be given immediately? When can we just monitor and give maybe give an antihistamine? And we also have the ability to check if we know a patient has especially severe reactions with very trace exposure. We also can check off if we want them to have epi no matter what, because um, there are some cases like that as well. So this is something that um, we do for every patient and you can find a lot of different versions of this. These are our currently available epinephrine auto injectors that are on the market. Um, and of course, I included all the different brands here just to be fair and balanced. Um, probably most widely used are the AviQ, the EpiPen, and the generic EpiPens. Um, AviQ has three different doses. So it has a smaller dose for babies that are less than 31 pounds um, that really don't need such a high dose of Epi. But that higher dose that's found in the others isn't harmful per se, but it's just maybe a little too much for those, for those babies. Um, they 
all have slightly different directions. Um, AviQ also talks to you. Um, so we have a lot of families that prefer that one because um, it just gives them a little bit more freedom that wherever they go, anyone can open the AviQ and use it properly. Um, I've literally had a four-year-old in the office open a sample trainer device and do it perfect exactly just like the instructions um, said. But all of these contain epinephrine, I, we really don't ultimately care which one a patient gets as long as it's something that they're comfortable using, they know how to use, and um, is accessible to them. There are alternatives to epinephrine auto-injectors probably coming soon, um, needle-free options. There's, uh, I, I listed this chart here, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but there are a lot of limitations to the current epinephrine auto injectors. We know that our patients don't always carry them. We know that they're quite bulky and large. We know that people are needle phobic and don't want to use it and are fearful of using it. There's a lot of different reasons why um, we have limitations and issues with them. So the probably the one coming out soon are the intranasal epinephrine devices. Um, these have been submitted to the FDA. Uh, the FDA wanted a little bit more data. They submitted more data. So probably coming soon. Um, and what's very interesting is that they have been shown to have faster and better pharmacokinetic profiles than injectable epi, which is crazy to think intranasally um, that we would see that. And then transdermal and sublingual epi are also being studied. Um, I'm not really quite aware of any of those studies because they're probably going to be a while to those actually come to market, but the intranasal ones will be coming soon. It's yet to be determined if this will really truly replace needle options, um, but it looks pretty promising. So we'll see. Stay tuned. So how do we treat anaphylaxis? Epinephrine is the only treatment for anaphylaxis. Antihistamines don't do anything for anaphylaxis. Oftentimes, if a patient had a systemic reaction, they feel like they got better 30 minutes after taking a Benadryl. It's not the Benadryl that did that. Guess what? That doesn't work that fast. It's just that the reaction went away on its own. It's really important that we educate our patients on epinephrine being first line, the only thing to, to stop systemic allergic reactions or anaphylaxis. Early recognition and administration of epi is super important. We use the phrase epi first, epi fast. When in doubt, just give epi. It's a benign, safe substance. There are no contraindications to giving epi. Two doses are available in the dose packs. Um, typically, they come with two. They're meant to be together, not separated. So that way, there's always a chance of needing a second one. You have that available. Um, and that's because some people, up to 19% of infants, do need a second dose. And biphasic reactions can happen where hours after resolution, symptoms come back. That's rare, but that's why we have two involved. And it's supposed to be given in the outer thigh, the vastus lateralis, as indicated by this image on the top here. And then here's a patient um, practicing with a, a fake device um, and showing where it should be injected. So when do we give epi? When we have those severe symptoms, just like we outlined, anytime there's cardiovascular, respiratory, or laryngeal symptoms, when you're in doubt, we recommend giving it. You can never do harm by giving epi too early or when a patient didn't need it. Um, sure, it's a needle, they might not love it, but you can never do harm by giving it too early. In fact, if anything, you did the right thing. I tell a lot of my patients and families, if you ever just have that gut instinct, even if the symptoms don't seem as bad as the ones that are listed on this list or the food allergy plan, if you just ever have that parental or caregiver instinct, my child does not look right or I just don't feel right, use it. Most studies indicate that when providers that are allergy trained would use epi is way before when a parent or a patient would use epi. So we know delayed administration is common, especially in the emergency department setting, which is getting quite better, but epinephrine is even underutilized in that setting. And it's very likely because they see the craziest things and they sometimes just don't think that a, a patient maybe warrants epinephrine, but they are in fact having a systemic allergic reaction. So there's no contraindication to I am epi, and then when in doubt, just give it. For mild reactions, we can look for and just monitor the patient, but these symptoms are typically just a little bit of hives, itching. If a patient has a few hives, but then that spreads more diffusely, that's when we can give epi. Some people will, some people won't. Um, but for those milder symptoms, they can be monitored. You can give an antihistamine, but remember if that progresses, the antihistamine is going to do nothing. So give epi. And then we typically, we prefer cetirizine or Zyrtec. Um, 
allergy providers, by the way, we hate diphenhydramine. We hate Benadryl. It's not great. Um, Zyrtec or cetirizine works faster, works better, works longer, um, and doesn't have the side effect profile related to um, Benadryl. So it's crazy that so many people reach for this. There's a lot of great articles on this recently that you can find on the web, but um, everyone reaches for Benadryl first, but we hate it. We never use it. So Zyrtec is the, is the one, but when, whatever, whenever this is happening, just give one of them. It doesn't really matter. But um, typically when we're providing that education, we'll talk to a family about how Zyrtec or cetirizine is preferred. Now, when the pandemic came about, we learned something new. And I want to include this because this can be really important when we're educating patients on allergic reactions. But when the pandemic happened, we discovered that patients were withholding epi for very obvious systemic allergic reactions because they were afraid that they had to go to the ER for monitoring. And it's really interesting because we found out that they, a lot of patients thought that epi was inherently dangerous and that's why they needed to go to the ER. When we realized it was a um, educational point that we were missing with them where we were not properly educating families that it's not the epi that is unsafe that makes you need to go to the ER. It's the fact that you just had a bad reaction. So this led to this whole discussion on, wow, how do we get our patients to use epi and understand this? And even if they feel like they can stay home, they can still manage allergic reactions while protecting them from being exposed to COVID or, or whatnot that nobody wanted to get, of course. So there were new guidelines that were released for at-home monitoring for anaphylactic, whoops, let me go back, sorry about that, for anaphylactic allergic reactions, where if the epinephrine was given, all these kind of protocols you could you could do at home to manage things. So if you're by yourself, you know, lay down near the door, make sure somebody knows, unlock the door. You can still take an antihistamine after you used epi if you're if you're if you feel like you need it, um, but then monitor symptoms. And if you don't get better, then use that second one if you need to or call for help. But if symptoms do improve, then you can just continue to monitor at home for four to six hours and monitor for recurrent symptoms and be ready to go if you need to, but then notify your provider on a non-urgent basis and get your medications refilled. Um, so it was really a way that we could alter our, our education that was lacking in this department um, with patients, but also provide them a way to manage their allergic reactions at home and keep them out of the ER. And um, this is something we still, some of us do today um, for the right patients. We talk about this quite a bit. Now, what's really important is talking about the risks and route of exposures and what can actually trigger allergic reactions. So this is another trigger warning subject. A lot of people are very passionate about it because there's a lot of social emotional anxiety related to food allergies, understandably. So let's talk a little bit about this. So reactions will occur typically from oral exposure and oral exposure only. So when you hear a story of somebody saying they can't even quote, be in the same room as peanut, that's usually not true. And that's a patient that has a higher level of significant food allergy related anxiety, and they should see us for right education. But we also have an awesome network of food allergy related mental health clinicians that will help along this process to help them realize that they're not truly at risk in those scenarios. And there's a lot of things that we can do to help them too. So ingestion is what will trigger a reaction for the vast majority of patients. And this has been well studied. That airborne exposure is not really a thing with the exception of a few allergens when they are being cooked or fried or baked, especially fish and shellfish. We know that those can get airborne. Not everybody will react to airborne fish and shellfish proteins, but we know those can get airborne. So you can imagine how this is a very sensitive subject. Um, and I have been in numerous conversations outside of the medical setting about this. And I just find that it's a very difficult thing to communicate because typically when there has been a reaction that people have witnessed, there's significant PTSD, medical related PTSD related to that. And we totally understand where people are coming from, but ultimately it's our job to educate and help improve the quality of life of our patients. So we'll talk about a few of these studies. We know that even the most severely allergic patients, specifically peanut, they've studied this a lot. They challenged kiddos that were the most sensitive kiddos where they literally will react to a quarter of a peanut or less. So a trace exposure, the most sensitive people, which is not super common. It's only, we're talking like 1% of the most sensitive peanut allergic patients. They challenged them, they triggered a reaction after oral ingestion, but then they put them near peanut butter and wiped it on the skin. And there were no concerning reactions. They've even gone so far to put 
do studies where they put these allergic patients in this kind of phone booth kind of thing and blow peanut powder all over them. And the worst symptoms that we would see would be a little bit of cough because of course they're inhaling these substances, um, eye irritation and some skin irritation. There were no anaphylactic reactions related to that study. We also know that peanut allergen can actually only be detected in the air. Now it can be detected on the ground in a lot of different places, but in the air when it's actively being shelled and it's only about, I think it's about eight inches over the active shelling. And then immediately when the shelling is stopped, those all go to the ground. We don't see airborne peanut protein. And like I talked about that one exception. So you can imagine how there's a lot of headlines about this. There's a lot of fear mongering here, even well-meaning food allergy kind of educational companies will talk about this. Um, and it's a topic that's not often brought up because we know it can be very triggering, but ultimately we have to follow the science and we have to follow the data. So this is my food allergy um, anaphylactic uh, statistics I, that I referred to earlier. It was, I did move it way back here. So what I, I intend to show with this is that the risk of fatal food anaphylaxis, and this also include venom anaphylaxis, if you look at this chart, you have more, uh, uh, almost the higher, let's see, um, a higher chance of being murdered or dying in a fire than you do of dying due to a fatal food allergy reaction. So I tell parents this all the time, hey, the true risk is actually very low thank goodness. Now it's awful and terrible and tragic when we hear about food allergy, fatal reactions, they are so terrible and sad and awful for those families. And the worst part is they're often preventable. Um, but the statistics tell us that those are the outliers. Thank goodness um, that most patients will never have a fatal food allergy reaction in their life. And if you look at this, like we alluded to earlier, adolescents and young adults are at the greatest risk. Look at these peaks um, between age 10 all the way to kind of age 20, 29, really, if we follow the, the highest kind of blocks here. So a big deal here to, to drive home to patients and parents and to educate them on the low risk of food allergic reactions. And um, by the way, the orange dots on this graph indicate fatality. So we see a lot of admissions when they're younger, but those fatality rates, thank goodness, are so low, but higher fatality rates in that age group, um, but still extremely rare. So I always like to talk about this as well when I'm giving a lot of food allergy education. Now, this extends to other practical kind of situations, um, traveling, school, things like that. We still obviously recommend for all these situations, epi needs to be available. They should always be carried it or it should always be carried. It should always be on the patient. But a large proportion of reactions occur outside the home in like restaurants or school, for example, daycares. But there's no evidence that there's increased risk on airplanes um, and no evidence that less reactions are actually seen in nut free settings, um, which is crazy that we have these rules and policies in place in school districts. And a lot of allergists have talked to different school districts about this that there's actually no evidence that there are less reactions because one, there are other allergens. There are still kids that are allergic to egg and milk and we're not telling people not to bring egg and milk into their schools or at this table. Um, so those are a lot of reasons why, but also because this can also create this kind of false sense of security that, oh, we're at a nut-free school. So no one's bringing nut when they really could be. So that's a big deal. There's actually less, um, there's no evidence that less reactions occur in nut-free settings. Um, and this can al also just enhance the social isolation and stigma related to food allergy, where this little kid or kids have to sit alone by themselves at a special table. Um, it just doesn't need to be done for most, um, most situations. We also take into consideration all the social and emotional considerations, like we referred to, if we feel that a family has excessive food allergy related quality of life issues or anxiety. Now, keeping in mind that some healthy level of anxiety is important in food allergy to keep you and your family members safe if they have food allergy. However, when it significantly decreases quality of life, when a patient doesn't travel, doesn't go to summer camp, doesn't go to sleepovers, birthday parties, um, you know, doesn't travel anywhere by plane, and it impacts their life in so many different ways, that's when we should really intervene, provide education, and refer to mental health clinicians who are trained in this field. Um, there are a, a huge food allergy counselor network that um, we can tap into to provide some assistance here. And um, important to point out, 25% of patients will experience food allergy bullying sometime in their life. Um, and many headlines promote fear. So when we see these 
awful headlines, you know, and the one that comes to mind, I have an airplane on this slide is, you know, when Southwest stops serving peanuts on their airplanes. And a lot of these studies that kind of came, come out, or I'm sorry, reports and, and uh, journal, um, rather newspaper articles or online articles about food allergic reactions occurring in the air. Most of the time when we read it from our lens as allergy providers, there's just something very suspicious or sketchy about that where we know that either the food was never ingested and this actually wasn't a food allergic reaction or it actually was ingested. Um, let's say a toddler picks up a peanut from the from the ground. So we really need that oral ingestion, but we don't see increased levels of, of peanut protein or reactions that we know of on airplanes. Um, one story that really comes to mind is a story of, of a plane, um, a, a mom being upset about an air, airline not accommodating her son's nut allergy and still considering um, to serve peanuts on the plane. So when they announced overhead that they were serving peanuts, um, what's interesting about this article is that it did say how the teenage son was just sitting there calmly listening with his headphones on, listening to music, pretty much dozing off. But when they started serving peanuts, this is a teenager who's not picking stuff off of the floor, we assume, right? When they started serving peanuts several rows ahead, the mom got increasingly agitated and concerned that her son was going to have a fatal allergic reaction just because they were serving peanuts. And then her anxiety amped up the son's anxiety, who then anxiety can kind of show up and, and sort of mimic anaphylaxis without objective signs, potentially. Then he was given his EpiPen. Then they had to make an emergency detour and landing. And it was this whole thing. When I'm reading this article, I'm just like, God, this kid was just sitting there not doing anything. And, and clearly this was not a peanut allergic reaction, but it makes the news and it causes a lot of fear mongering. But of course, this is a very sensitive subject to families with food allergy. And I do not mean to dismiss any fears or concerns, but really just want to see if this applies to you, if you feel like you do are, are a family with food allergy and you do have excessive fear or anxiety related to this, come and talk to us because we can help or get you to the person that can. So really important to point that out. So I think I drove, drove that point home enough. So we'll move on. <clears throat> so our last section here is a little bit about treatment. And then we're going to talk about a little bit about early introduction and then we'll wrap up. So there are numerous food immunotherapy or treatment options available now and many in late phase studies that will probably come to market soon. The ones that we're going to talk about are primarily the ones that are more widely done and FDA approved. Um, oral immunotherapy, which is FDA approved for peanut allergy in ages four to 17 years of age, but also off-label use is done in numerous allergy practices for other foods or multiple foods. Then we have EPIT or epicutaneous immunotherapy, which is um, the most common research done on the peanut patch where this patch is worn on the skin for a period of time to desensitize patients to the food allergens. Sublingual immunotherapy, where it's applied under the tongue in drop form and promotes tolerance that way through the GI tract, like we learned about with the dual allergen exposure hypothesis, helping to promote tolerance. None of these therapies are curative. They just help to protect from adverse reactions related to accidental exposures. Um, omalizumab is a FDA approved medication we'll talk a little bit about that's been available um, for patients for a long time since 2003 for other conditions, but was just FDA approved for food allergy literally a few weeks ago. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, some other things that are they're looking at immunotherapy plus some type of treatment option. Um, DNA vaccines, and then even fecal transplantations, which we're not going to really get into, we're just going to talk about the ones that are really here now that we're using. So oral immunotherapy works by giving increasing amounts of the allergen daily or over a specific period of time to induce tolerance and decrease risk of reaction and increase the threshold dose eliciting reaction. So basically a good way to think of this is it can help make somebody bite proof where they could have an exposure and not have hopefully very mild clinical symptoms or maybe not even have clinical symptoms related to that food ingestion. It does not allow for at lib willy nilly food ingestion of that allergen. We still tell avoidance, uh, our, our patients to avoid the food with the exception of their OIT dose. And it is not curative with a small exception for very young children, which we're not doing, it's not FDA approved yet, but some people are doing in the research setting or off-label in very young children, we can actually potentially induce something called sustained unresponsiveness where they are no longer allergic. So we can kind of disease, uh, modify the disease, if you will. And the only way to know if someone has achieved that is to actually stop the treatment after doing all the work to get up there, stop the treatment and then challenge them to the food and see if they can eat it. So the efficacy of OIT is very, very high with 
67% on um, on this therapy in their trial, 67% of patients actually could tolerate 600 milligrams of peanut protein, which one peanut is about 250 milligrams of peanut protein. So this is a little bit more than two peanuts. Um, so that is where the theory comes in that it's going to allow um, to, pr to protect from trace exposures. Now, the general OIT schedule varies product to product or place to place, but in general, there's an initial dose escalation day. That's usually a day they come into the office. They're there for several hours. They get several doses of super, super tiny amounts going up a little bit more each time with some monitoring in between doses. Then they continue that last dose at home and they come in every two weeks for up dosing where we do a higher dose in the office. Then they continue that next dose at home. And then we come in and do more up dosing, eventually getting up to maintenance, which in the FDA approved product, Palforzia um, peanut powder, they're mixing it with yogurt every day. They're eating that. Um, that um, uh, we call the maintenance dose. And that one is about 300 milligrams, which is a little bit more than one peanut. So that's what they're continuing at home um, every day um, for life. And if they stop, then many patients will get their allergy back, of course, um, and they'll have to restart this OIT process. So it's a big process. I think a lot of people really are interested in this, but when they find out the time that goes into that, then um, they might decide to delay this or not do it um, for their child or for themselves. Now, omalizumab, which has been around since 2003, it was first FDA approved for um, severe allergic asthma and then for chronic urticaria, or chronic hives, and then nasal polyposis. Now it's available for food allergy. Um, really, this came about because there was a huge unmet need for strategies that can address multiple food allergies outside of OIT while reducing reactions and improving overall quality of life. The pros with omalizumab is that it's not food specific and it's typically intermittent dosing every two or four weeks, depending on the patient. We know it's very safe. Um, it's approved down to age one, um, but we've been using it for over 20 years um, for patients with allergic asthma. And we have a lot of safety data behind it. It can also help control comorbidities, especially allergic asthma, which we now know is a risk factor for potentially more severe reactions. And of course there's disadvantages like cost and long-term use and, and dosing restrictions. Um, we can't really go above their recommended doses to treat this, even if we feel like a patient could do a little bit better on a higher dose. So that's a challenge there. Now, really how it works is that it binds to the free IgE, decreasing the cell bound IgE, decreasing the expression of these cells and mediator release from allergic cells like mast cells, and then thereby decreasing the allergic inflammation when that allergen is ingested by the patient. So it really blunts that response without suppressing the rest of the immune system. So looking at this study, this outmatch study, very briefly, I don't want to dive in too far here. They looked at patients that could ingest a single dose of 600 milligrams of peanut protein, but also looked at safety, of course. And then could they also ingest other foods like that they were allergic to, like cashew, milk, or egg? Um, so the data actually tells us that it was hugely successful. So um, patients that um, before Zol or Zolar versus placebo or omalizumab, I apologize, um, Zolar is the brand name for this, um, omalizumab versus placebo, 67% of them versus 6.8% were able to tolerate that threshold dose. And you can see these, the, the numbers are, are sky high for most of these foods that were involved as a secondary endpoint with cashew, just historically, just being very difficult to treat, um, having a little bit of a lower number, but it's still very statistically significant. So that's just a little bit about that. Um, this is a typically a decision that we discuss with families and patients if they do wanna start these therapies. There's a lot to weigh in, a lot of factors. It's a very nuanced discussion. Um, who do we treat really depends on the patient and family goals. I did my doctorate, um, uh, my doctoral dissertation on quality of life before and after peanut oral immunotherapy. So I'm really, really interested in, you know, who makes a good candidate. And most of the studies, not just my thesis, but many other studies that have been published actually tell us that the food related, food allergy related quality of life is the biggest predictor at successful OIT. So both on physical symptoms and um, I guess uh, compliance with maintenance treatment, as well as mental factors. So what we mean by that is if we have someone who's done very well most of their life and a family who doesn't have a lot of food allergy related anxiety besides the typical stuff and their quality of life is, you know, yes, impacted by the food allergy, but they're able to function and live and thrive without significant related anxiety to that food allergy that 
they do great with that with or without OIT. They don't need OIT to help enhance their life in any way. And a lot of those patients pre and post OIT won't have any improved parameters. And sometimes their quality of life even worsens with OIT in the studies because they went from just avoiding this food and doing great to having to take something every day. Um, and it's important to consider both the patient and the parent's anxiety. A lot of these studies look at maternal anxiety specifically, but those can play a role in who decides to do this. But on the flip side, the patients who do the best with OIT or any type of food allergy treatment are the ones that have worse pre-treatment quality of life, where they're extremely limited, they're extremely anxious, there's a lot of stress related to the food allergy, this opens up doors to them and gives them peace of mind that their child or themselves are safe um, from accidental exposures. All right, a little bit about prevention of food allergy to wrap up. So the new NIH guidelines were developed in 2007, which was, they were based on the first randomized controlled study of early introduction to prevent food allergy. So how the study came to be, George Dutois, who did this study in the UK, he was very aware that children in Israel actually had extremely low rates of peanut allergy compared to the UK. And after discovering what he thought was because they actually ingest a snack that many of us know now called bombas, they're like little peanut puffs, they ingest the snack and peanut in their diet very early in life. And so he theorized that wow, these kiddos don't necessarily have less atopic disease, but they're getting peanut very early where our guidelines in the UK are to delay introduction. So is this related? So he designed a study to look at this. He introduced patients that were considered high risk infants. So age four to 11 with severe eczema or egg allergy, which are both high risk for peanut allergy. And they put them in a consumption group where they ate peanut in some amount three times a week for five years, or they avoided it. And then they looked to see how many of these kids at after five years are allergic. And in the peanut consumption group, only about 2% were found to be allergic. In the avoidance group, almost 14% were found to be allergic with an 80% difference. So that's over 80% difference. That's huge, right? So then they came up with these new guidelines about how important it would be potentially to create new guidelines to discuss early introduction of these foods rather than withholding them. And I just, um, you know, researched this recently for a project that I did. We know that despite these guidelines being out, the updated guidelines, this study came out and then, you know, the updated guidelines kind of followed in 2019. We know that we're not doing a great job following this um, from a primary care perspective. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So the current infant feeding guides, these are only existing for peanut, but we know this probably applies to other highly allergenic foods. Guideline one states if the patient has severe eczema, egg allergy, or both, that they should really be seen by us to do um, skin prick testing and possibly oral food challenge based on those results. But we want to introduce and intervene early. Those with mild to moderate eczema, we want to introduce peanut containing foods around six months of age. They're not necessarily considered high risk. And, and those with no eczema and no personal history of food allergy, they can really just eat it whenever they want, but usually we'll still recommend doing it by six months. Now, it's important to remember that a lot of our clinicians might not feel confident discussing or diagnosing what's severe eczema versus moderate. So I'll tell patients and, and other providers all the time, if you're not sure, just send them because we can still give the right guidance. So when we have that patient that has history of severe eczema, uh, eczema egg allergy, or both, then we can look at either peanut IgE or skin prick test. If the peanut IgE is negative, we introduce it and they usually do great. If it's positive, then they should come to us for skin testing anyway. So this is where we just recommend, you know what, just send them to us and we'll do the skin test. Babies with eczema will typically pop up positive to a lot of foods um, regardless on blood testing. So we prefer to do skin testing. So when we do the skin test in the office, if they have a negative result, then we'll recommend introducing the food at home. If they have significant anxiety about doing that, we'll do what we call a supervised feeding in the office where we just give them a spoonful of peanut butter and watch them in the office and we know that they do quite well. Um, if it's an equivocal result, if it's a low level positive, now we know these can just be false positives, right? We will, that risk of reaction varies quite a bit. So we'll typically do a supervised feeding in the office um, via an oral food challenge. We might be a little bit more cautious there. And then when it's over eight uh, is when we already know ah, we're too late to intervene here um, from an early introduction standpoint, that patient's already allergic. 
So who's considered high risk? Those patients with severe atopic dermatitis or eczema. This is typically patients that require um, escalating strengths of topical steroids. They don't have much of a break between exacerbations of their AD if they have a break at all. They, it's chronic and relapsing, ongoing, no matter what you throw at it, or they have a widespread body surface area. So those are the highest risk patients. If they have evidence of other food allergy, specifically egg allergy, they are considered high risk. Those patients with mild, mild to moderate eczema are just have a little bit more risk than the general population. Um, and we should introduce early, but they don't necessarily need testing. Um, a family history of A to P is another risk factor, um, just slightly above the general population risk. But it's important to note that having one sibling with a food allergy does not make the younger sibling at risk for food allergy just because the older sibling does. With one exception, that being that those kiddos will often have delayed introduction because their older sibling also has that food allergy. So in those homes, it's really tricky because the parents want to introduce these foods when there might already be an older sibling with that food allergy. And that older sibling might only be a toddler who doesn't know to not just grab things and put them in their mouths, right? So we'll see delayed introduction as a possible contributor here, and we can walk through families and, and decide who needs testing based on their risk. The dietary guidelines recommend, of course, we know exclusive breastfeeding for three months or sorry, six months of life through at least the first year of life and introduce nutrient dense foods starting around six months and including those potentially allergenic foods. And we know that introducing those foods for most of these things can help prevent the risk of developing food allergy. And this is why unnecessary avoidance is not a good thing. And, and doing unnecessary testing that leads to that is a big deal. Um, and then, of course, for peanut, recommend within four to six months in patients that are high risk for peanut allergy, um, really typically after referral to us. When do we start this conversation with parents? Well, early and often, as much as you can, this should be incorporated to all well child visits for all the time that our primary care or pediatric um, colleagues have to go over everything they need to cover. This should also be inserted in there. And, and I'm pleased to hear that some of the EMRs have caught up to this and actually have this as a question. Um, but we can at least start the conversation, um, drop this, kind of drop hints about this. Um, and then as that child approaches that four to six month time frame is when we really, really, really want to have this discussion. Um, and if patients are high risk, or if you're not sure, just send them to us. And we talked a lot about the IgE, IgE testing and how it's not helpful as a screening test. There are a lot of resources online about the practical aspects of this. What we don't want to do is medicalize feeding to babies. We don't want parents to be worried about introducing them, but there are a lot of practical considerations like, how do I know if my baby's ready? And how do I introduce this? This stuff is pretty thick. Will my child choke on this? You know, all those kind of practical things that go into this. So there are two websites that I typically refer patients to. Um, babiesfirst.org, it's actually um, created by FAIR, um, the foodallergy.org website. It's kind of like a sister website to them. It talks about how to introduce these foods. It gives you even ways to um, tips and tricks of ways to introduce this. And then I really like Food Allergy Canada, um, which also has awesome resources about how to introduce um, very um, potentially allergenic foods to your baby early and walks through some practical tips there as well. So awesome resources there. Now, when do we refer to an allergist? So any patient, of course, that you suspect has a diagnosis of food allergy, a patient that might have difficult to control atopic dermatitis, you should refer to us as well. We can really strongly manage that. Um, a lot of patients will refer, get referred to derm and us for the food allergy eval. We do that all too. We, we do AD, we do atopic dermatitis um, and studies will show it's no different than what our dermatology colleagues do. So um, please send them our way, especially if you think they also have food allergy. If you suspect based on history that a patient has a food allergy, but they have negative IgE testing, and you of course only ordered that one food in question, um, then refer to us as well. For high-risk patients with severe eczema or other food allergy, especially egg allergy, if we have a positive IgE test without prior introduction, which shouldn't really be happening after this talk, but if a colleague of yours, let's say, ordered um, serum IgE testing without a history um, and you're not sure what to do with those results, please just send them our way. Of course, if there's overly concerned, worried parents or caregivers, we can provide a lot of evidence-based knowledge and tips and tricks about how to go about introducing foods, using all those resources, or even doing supervised introductions in the office if they have significant anxiety. And then of course, ongoing follow-up and evaluation in patients that we know already have food allergy to kind of check in on things time to time. 
And in general, we do recommend that it's preferable to not do any testing prior to seeing us, but we understand that's not always feasible um, if there is a wait to get in to see us or if um, parental pressure is kind of pushing you that way where you feel like you have to order something, but you know now not to do full food panels, of course. Now, my top takeaways from today's discussion is that the prevalence of food allergy is increasing, that clinical history is the most important. I hope um, I drilled that home enough, that testing does not always correlate with clinical allergy, that broad food panels should never be done, that epinephrine is the only treatment for anaphylactic reactions, that starting food immunotherapy or treatment is a long dis discussion and decision between patient, family, and providers to determine who's right for that therapy, and that early introduction of allergenic foods between four to six months can prevent allergy. And that's all I have. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me here and I'd be happy to discuss anything. Thank you so much.